Okay. Now I can. There we go. There we go. Continue. <laughs> it, it is going. Uh, um, so, and we have a really good um, turnout, actually, right now, 125 people. Oh. That's really super. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself because you're going to do the introduction, right, David? I am. Yeah. Um, and people are still joining, but um, my introduction will take a minute. So, <laughs> uh, um, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, good evening. My name is David Stone, and I teach in the Department of Classical Studies at the University of Michigan. And I am the Secretary Treasurer of the Ann Arbor Society of the Archaeological Institute of America. I want to begin by thanking you for helping us set a new record audience for this evening. It is fabulous to have so many people in attendance, many more than can fit even in the standing room only section at the back of the Kelsey Museum lecture room. Um, who would have known that 20 people from Southern Methodist University would register for this lecture? Howdy and welcome. Uh, um, a word about our sponsor, the AIA, the Archaeological Institute of America, a great organization supporting archaeology around the world. It organizes speakers for events like this, sponsors students to learn about archaeology through participation in archaeological uh, expeditions. It um, publishes a popular magazine and a professional journal. It convenes an annual meeting of archeologists in the US and Canada, runs trips to archeological sites and promotes heritage and conservation activities. I encourage you to become a member at archeological.org if you do not already belong. It's a pleasure tonight to introduce Beth Green. Uh, Beth is associate professor at the University of Western Ontario. She is Canada Research Chair in Roman Archaeology uh, starting last year, which is a fabulous achievement. Um, she's principal investigator of the Vindolanda Northfield Excavation and director of the Vindolanda Field School. Uh, she's a superb scholar and well-known expert on Roman Britain and the lives of people living in Roman frontier zones. And as we're about to find out, a, a dynamic field archeologist and speaker as well. Um, so uh, uh, just a word about sort of how we're gonna do things this evening. Um, Beth is, is going to lecture and then uh, she will take questions. And if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen and we will take the questions from there. And uh, um, uh, there's opportunity to chat as well, but we'll take all the questions from the Q&A. Um, so please put your questions there. And if you have chats that you wanna do, you can do them in the, the chat function. Uh, okay, um, I need to stop sharing so that Beth can share. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, David. Let me just get this going. Uh, are you guys seeing that? I'm assuming yes. Super, and, yeah. yeah and you can see the full screen, not the uh, presenter mode. That's always a drag. Yes, it's cool. Okay, excellent. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm a little bit bummed, in fact, that I'm not in Ann Arbor because I have all of these funny uh, connections to Ann Arbor and to U of M, in fact. Um, my dad went to U of M many, many decades ago, the 60s, and my mom was an Ipsy girl. She went to Eastern, and uh, my brother-in-law went to Michigan for two degrees, and in fact, my old PhD supervisor also was swept away to Michigan after Chapel Hill. I did my PhD in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I'm actually very, very often in Ann Arbor still because though I'm in Canada, but most of you, if you're out there knowing me, 
you know that I am in fact uh, American and living in London, Ontario, I'm actually only about two hours and a little bit from you guys. So in fact, hopefully one day I will um, be able to talk to you in person again about some, some other things that I do. Um, it's also a little bit funny. Uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to give this talk because my, because exactly that my PhD, my old PhD supervisor is out there. And he may remember from 10 years ago that this is the precise topic that I was talking about 10 years ago. It remains one of my most popular uh, and most, um, most requested talks. So I continue to give it. And every year I say, that's the last time I'm giving that talk. And then people want to hear it again. So I keep giving it. So Nick, you're going to recognize some of this, but I promise you I have moved on in the 10 years. So I am indeed talking about the social lives of Roman soldiers and the role of wives and children and families in these Roman military communities. I have focused predominantly on the Roman West, though not exclusively, um, mostly because I work at Vindolanda and I have done that since um, 2002. And the, the material there, the archeology span and the evidence is just really spectacular. But what I've been trying to do for a long time is in fact, bring in a lot of other evidence. So looking not just at the archeology, span but everything that kind of you know, revolves around it and how we can really get a bigger picture and try to understand not just perhaps patterns of artifacts, but what the, the social um, result, what, what, it, what comes of those artifacts and how can we understand a sort of social picture of this group of people. So that's what I've been doing for a long time. I'm gonna back up because I know with 130 something people in here, I probably have some people that don't you know, know much about the Roman military and things like that. So to give you a bit of background, the first question you might be asking yourself is what's the issue with women, children, and the Roman army? Why do we even need to be discussing that? And one of the major ways to answer that is through this thing called the ban of on marriage for serving soldiers. So soldiers, in fact, in the Roman military, um, in certainly the first couple of centuries, uh, were not allowed to marry, first couple of centuries CE, that is, were not allowed to marry while they were in the military. But yet we have a ton of evidence, in fact, that women were there and they were doing things. Um, and we have evidence like this picture here where you're seeing a military tribune and his wife who was a priestess. Now, we've realized since that there, there is actually some nuance to this and officers were allowed to marry. And so we know that there were some women in these spaces. Um, so it didn't really make sense to never talk about women and families in the military communities. And so that's kind of where I started to pick up on this. So the ban on marriage, what we know about it, um, people have kind of obsessed about this ban on marriage for a while. Um, we know from our ancient authors that something like this, Augustus made many changes and innovations, et cetera, et cetera. It was with great reluctance that he allowed even his generals to visit their wives and then only in the winter season, which a lot of people have taken as um, this, this part of the, this ban that supposedly came around in around 13 BCE. But then we have social reality that comes into play. So in the first and second centuries, we also have things like this from an author like Gaio Cassius that says, um, he's talking about the Varuschlacht, the, um, the destruction of three legions in Germany, where he says, they had with them many wagons and many beasts of burden as in times of peace. Moreover, not a few women and children and a large retinue of servants were following them. And this is by no means the only uh, piece of literature that says, you know, there were lots of other people in the baggage train and all of these um, non-soldiers were kind of hanging around the, the military. So we have a lot of evidence that um, in fact, they were there anyway. And then we have this notion that supposedly the emperor Septimius Severus in the end of the second century took this ban away. Now, all of that to say, I actually don't really care about this marriage ban at all because what I'm really trying to look at is social reality. And the best place to do that, in fact, is with the archeology span and to actually look at the artifacts, depositional patterns and try to understand who was on these sites and living in these military communities. Even if, so people can argue till they're blue in the face about whether Septimius Severus in fact took away the marriage ban and allowed soldiers to marry. But in fact, I don't think it's gonna change social reality one bit. And if he actually did that, he was only making uh, law, making legal what was social reality anyway. So all that to say, I don't care about the marriage ban. What I'm really looking at are some other, some other things. And also trying to go from a point of just saying, hey, there were women and children there to let's figure out what their social role was and what their function was and how does that change our view of the Roman military. So the state of the research question then, just to kind of give you a brief view of where this has come from and where it's going, 
through the 1990s and 2000s, effectively, people were proving the presence of non-combatant individuals, which is kind of a little bit ridiculous. It's like very first wave feminist and, uh, you know, feminism. And, and here we are proving that they're actually there. And to quote um, somebody in my PhD defense 10 years ago, they said, wait, why is the onus on you to prove that they were there as opposed to what most human communities have, men, women, children, right? Um, Nick, that was Don, of course. Um, the second thing that happens is that now we're trying to find the individuals. We're trying to find the actual social roles, the status, and the lived experience of these individuals. It does sound very, you know, last 10 years, if you're in the field of archaeology, you can say, yeah, yeah, I can see where we've been doing that. But what's interesting is through that, we still have these continued detractors to the presence of women in, in the forts themselves. So everybody's kind of always known you've got these communities in the background. But these sort of people still, as recently as 2017, um, Jan Le Bohek, who's a big military scholar, you know, said, no, 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 we don't have them in the forts. We can't really ever imagine them in the forts. And I, I don't think that's true at all. So what have been the, the past, uh, past viewpoints and where do I see the problems in that scholarship? Well, a couple of things here. The number one is that the evidence suggesting a female presence was very often relegated to something that archeologists used to call, not anymore, stray finds or identified as something like, oh, this must be the prostitutes that inevitably lived in this community. Well, sure, there were probably prostitutes, but certainly every artifact that betrays the presence of a female, um, we, you can see the problem if we call every single one of those uh, having belonged to a prostitute. Another problem I saw was that non-combatants were considered part of the community only in the third century after this supposed legal change under Septimius Severus, which lately we don't even really think is probably um, something that actually happened historically. Um, this is very important for epigraphic evidence because any inscription that named a wife was sort of relegated to the third century. And so really we were only thinking about you know, what might be considered the late empire but really, this is the case for straight through, even if we have this ban going in under Augustus at the end of the first century BC, we have these people um, in the military community straight through the whole time. Um, another issue, number three, families of soldiers were relegated to the category of camp followers, which was a group that was usually described as a ramshackle kind of community or always in negative terms. Um, some of the quotes are like they were living in a shanty town outside the fort. So a lot of this was actually about rehabilitating this community and seeing them as a legitimate community surrounding the military. Um, for one reason, if you look at any modern army in the last 400 years, modern to an archeologist, um, you'll see that actually you ha always have these supporting communities surrounding militaries. And that is often considered the very success that they could have is because you have other people doing things that the soldiers don't need to do. So why would we not have this uh, for the mil Roman military as well? Okay. Um, and then one of the last things that, that I've sort of dove into is that w if there was an acceptance of the presence of certain women and children, and a good example of that is the officers' families. We have a lot of good evidence that the officers' families were there. It was without any further consideration of social roles or how their presence changes the understanding of military life. So in other words, it was easy to say, okay, yep, yeah, they were there, good, moving on, we don't need to think about them. And that's about the only group of people I feel like we ever say that about. Everybody's sort of interested in all these different communities. But for some reason, this one, it was easy to just brush off. And so we hadn't really thought about who they were and what their lives were like there um, and, and, and how they were changing military life. Okay, so we're gonna use Vindolanda as a case study to explore some of these themes and topics. So Vindolanda, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the site, is up on the British frontier and the frontier of Britannia. So Britannia, all the way up here in the red circle, uh, the frontier is all the way up here in different parts at different times, but for the most part, it is in very Northern England, um, not Scotland, uh, Hadrian's Wall, but also predating Hadrian's Wall. And I'll show you a map from before Hadrian's Wall. So Britain was conquered, Britannia in 43 CE, and then the Romans, um, the, the military, I should say, who knows if these are Romans, we have a whole bunch of auxiliary soldiers who are a part of this, um, who are not Roman at all. So we can talk about that as well. 
Um, so the, the military kind of defends and or kind of fights their way up to the north and settles this kind of, you know, frontier line in the end of the first century, somewhere around sort of the 70s or the 80s when our first settlements are, are coming to light there. And in fact, that's what Vindolanda is a part of. So this is a map down here of the, what we call the Stangate frontier. So the line of Hadrian's wall is on here. It's that green dot. That's where, so anyone who's hiked the wall and done that really fantastic hike, um, that's where you were. And the line of this, what we call the Stangate, obviously a medieval, you know, later um, bastardization of some name that came right across here. We know of it from about Carlisle to Corbridge. We don't know much about the road itself, but there's a line of forts that seem to be defending this early, potentially called a frontier. I put that in scare quotes sometimes because some people argue it was no such frontier. But anyway, we have a line of forts that by the late first century were, were settled and Vindolanda is part of that. And note Vindolanda's location right here smack in the middle of, of that defense line. So it's actually got a, a very central location, but not on one of the major roads that comes up from the south or goes north. So actually not, you know, it's it kind of in between two of those major roads that go in opposite directions. Um, and this just zooms you in a little bit closer on the area right around Vindolanda itself. You're right on the Stangate Road. The fort sits facing directly, its north gate sits directly on the Stangate. Here's Hadrian's Wall up here. It's about a mile and a half as the crow flies kind of thing. Um, and then you have, you know, streams and various things all around the area. If you've ever been to Vindolanda, this is the site that you're used to seeing if you think in plans, which probably most of you do not. Um, but if you think in plans, you paid your ticket right over here and you came down that classic Roman road. You, you saw a little uh, temple right here, a very standard um, Romano-Celtic style temple here. Or you might have seen our little excavation huts are right over here. And then you came down a, a really good example of a Roman road with its original paving and everything, its original stone lines. That is our period seven, eight. These are the visible remains. And so you saw the stone buildings through here and the fort through here. If you haven't been there in quite some time, then you probably are thinking, whoa, there are a lot more buildings. There indeed are far more buildings than were ever on display that we've excavated in the last sort of 10 to 15 years. But when you are, what we want to think about when you're walking around, you're just seeing the stone. But what I'm actually talking about today is what lies beneath. And this is in what we call anaerobic conditions. And this, the, this is where sort of the meat of the matter at Vindolanda really lies. Um, everything there is amazing, but what we're really known for are these early timber forts. And what you're seeing here, this green shaded area, that is the outline and the rough sort of shape and size of the period four timber fort. So dating from, um, and then also actually period one, two, and three are also underneath in this space. Period four is the largest one, so I've demonstrated that. And these are the large timber forts. We call them the pre-Hadrianic forts because they're before Hadrian's Wall was built, and they date to roughly 85 to 120 CE. So this is really where we find some amazing things because of those anaerobic conditions. So anaerobic means that there's no oxygen getting into the soil. And sometimes this is also called anoxic conditions. Um, and that means that you're not gonna have the typical uh, bacteria that you would normally find in soil. And therefore you won't have the breakdown of organic materials that are more typical of an archeological site. So um, if you had, um, you know, if you've ever been on an excavation and you've been digging through dry soil, this is obviously, I don't even wanna say oxidized, it's just a dry environment that's not going to preserve organic material very well. Maybe sometimes robust bone and things like that. Um, but what we find here at Vindolanda are all of the timber remains from the early fort. So we actually know what they looked like. What you're looking at here is something quite extraordinary, um, a, a timber um, uh, floor. That, those are actually wooden planks on a floor and sitting right into their sort of sleeper beams and, and um, supports underneath the floor. So this is the kind of conditions that we find. We also find what, what's called wattle and daub walls and, and fences and things that would have been plastered over. So um, a sort of combination of mud and twigs that go between upright timbers 
that create the walls and then they would have plastered over and created a more solid thing where we find all of that at Vindolanda. What you're looking at the image on the right here is the way to excavate this kind of stuff. This is in fact a ditch, a fort ditch, so a defensive ditch which was then filled in and those became anaerobic or semi-anaerobic as well depending on what kind of archaeology went over top and sealed out the oxygen whether that happened or not. So you're also, if you've ever been on an excavation, particularly in a dry Mediterranean environment or any dry environment anywhere in the world, you're looking at this and thinking chaos, right? Complete chaos. Um, it is something you need to get used to. And actually Nick's probably laughing because this doesn't look nearly like uh, the San Bono excavation being, you know, dozens of feet down in the center of Rome and, and hauling buckets up of just pure liquid dirt. Um, this looks actually rather orderly. Um, but what we're doing here is pulling um, squares of, of, of anaerobic soil, anaerobic, you know, layers out as big as we can. And the point of that is to make as few cuts through it. But, and people have often said to us, well, well what, how come, you know, you don't want to cut through something, but in fact, it's actually better to just straight cut through something with a very sharp spade, like a wooden artifact is my point rather than taking a trowel and scraping over top of it, because then you're just going to shatter it into um, dozens, if not hundreds of, of little bits. So we do this, we pass it up to the people who are screening the material up at the top, and that's how we find out, we, we find the little artifacts, the little bone, you know, game counters and the little writing tablets and the wooden items. Now, what you're also seeing, though, is a place where we would find dozens and dozens of shoes. And that is, in fact, how, why I'm talking about this, because we are, the site is very well known for its massive assemblage of Roman shoes. And whenever somebody says, well, what do you mean massive? Yeah, you know, how many do you have? Well, we have about probably 5,000. So I'm still currently um, putting all of this into a workable database. But we have 7,315 leather small find objects, distinct objects, whether that's sort of a bag of scraps from one the same part of a ditch or a shoe or a little patch. There are 7,315 of these. And we think that around 5,000 of them are shoes. And I'm actually going to know this within the next two weeks. Like all my data is going to the, the database folks very soon. So that's exciting. Um, the point of the Vindolanda shoes and why they're so exciting is that they represent the people who lived at this site. So what you're looking at here is this image um, from the Vindolanda Museum in, in Northumberland. And when they redid the museum about 10 years ago, they made a very conscious decision to display in order that visitors to the museum would think about the people who lived there. So rather than concentrating on the sort of shiny coins and the bling and the, you know, these things and those things, they really wanted people to think about the daily, everyday life of the folks who live there in antiquity. And I think that shoes really get you to that. They really work in that way. So that's what you're looking at when you walk into the museum. And that's exactly the way I use the shoe assemblage as well. The picture down here is just a, a, a picture, an image of a ubiquitous kind of uh, military boot that we find on the site. But we have, as you can see from this image, dozens and dozens of different kinds of shoes. Some have more decoration. Now, the very best ones, of course, are on display. Um, some of them are pretty standard where you just have kind of this one here, let's say, has just a little kind of tie up in the front. Um, others are what we call a carbatina, which is just a shoe that has no hobnails on the bottom, so no um, metal studs to, to walk upon. They're more of maybe a house shoe. Here's another one of these very standard military boots. So highly decorative shoes, totally bog standard shoes, and everything in between. Uh, these two right here, or three actually, four are wooden clogs to be used in the bathhouse. So that's kind of cool. They're missing their sort of leather that would have gone over your foot to hold the shoe on. So lots of different kinds of shoes that really allow us to see the different people that are living at this fort. And that's where the demography comes in. That's where the shoes come in for me. So a lot of people always say, hey, you know, do you love shoes? Do you have lots of shoes? I'm like, no and no. Like, you know, people who know me, I'm not really that like high fashion at all. I don't have a million pairs of shoes. I'm really interested in the people who wore them and who were the, living there at the fort and how we can get at that. So let's do a couple case studies. Let's think about that at Vindolanda. Um, the period four is very interesting. This dates to 105 to 120 CE. And we have four buildings. There's actually a little bit more to look at now. We just excavated a cavalry barrack over here. 
Um, and I'm working on a paper with Andrew Burley, who's the director of the excavations at Vindolanda, to compare a lot of these different sites because we also have some really interesting stuff from the extra mural, the, the outside of the fort, people living outside of the fort from this period as well. But for now, I'm going to show you some of these uh, interior fort spaces and how sort of shocking some of this evidence truly was. Because before, um, I should shout out to a, a, an individual named Carol Vanville Murray, who did a lot of this work in the 90s, really slogged through um, the first steps of saying, hey, look, there's a whole bunch of women and children living in these forts, and we just have to accept that and, and move forward. And she got a lot of flack, actually, from a lot of different corners about this. And I was able to sort of swing in, continue looking at the Vindal on the shoes and just kind of not deal with any of that, thanks to her and other people like Lindsay Allison Jones and other players in, in this kind of push to understand the military in a more holistic way. So at Vindolanda, what, what Carol figured out back in the 90s, this barrack block right here, she was looking at that and realizing there are loads of children's shoes in there. Um, some people want to say, well, hey, maybe those aren't uh, habitational layers in terms of the stratigraphy. Maybe um, that was material that was brought in from elsewhere. Well, there's nothing about the archaeology that suggests it was. It all looks like habitational right there in its very um, location. And one of the really interesting things about all of these buildings, it, they do seem to have been covered over very quickly as the unit departed. Um, and we even get the cavalry barrack that I mentioned that, that was excavated uh, over here under some later fort buildings. Um, that seemed to have everything in place, like even all of the stuff associated with a horse, like, um, you know, piss pits and things like that. Those are all kind of situated right in that, in that space with very few human artifacts. And on just the other side where you would have the humans living, you have all of these fantastic artifacts that seem to belong to these cavalry units. So it does seem as though we have these habitational layers kind of in their, in their condition right when they went into the archaeological record. Of course, everything moves a little bit, but it doesn't seem as though we have material being brought in and sort of leveling fill, if you will. So. We have a barrack block here, which Carol Vandrell Murray had realized was just chock-a-block with women and children. We have something called a scola, which is sort of a, a so-called scola, um, a, an officer's mess space. That's what we think that that place is. Um, and then the classic archeological building one and building two, meaning we don't actually know what they were used for, these two spaces. Um, but when we look at, and I'm kind of zipping through some of this so that we can talk about the social roles as well. Um, when we look at all of this together, when you look at period four, and I want to point out the date as well, 105 to 120, we have to imagine that we're dealing with closer to the period of abandonment in 120, um, though people do keep shoes around for 15 years, just look at my parents' closet, definitely keep shoes around for a long time. But if you look at this, this plan here, and sorry for the kind of crappy plan, but I think this really displays nicely with all of the circles, that in every space we've excavated, and this is also true of the cavalry barrack that was excavated recently, though far fewer belonging to women and children, and then the extramural spaces, which we would expect, everywhere in period four, we see this, uh, the presence through the footwear of women, adolescents, um, and children. And so that's really interesting because here we are in one, let's say it's 120. If we did, even if we were working with these notions of the marriage ban between let's say 13 BC and the very end of the, of the second century CE, then we are right in the middle of that. We're nowhere near getting rid of it. And like I said, I don't really think that anything much changed. Anyway, we're really dealing with that period right in the middle when we wouldn't expect to have these individuals inside of the fort spaces. Yet every single building that we've excavated from this period has reveals the presence in some way of women and children. Now, if you're wondering what this women adolescent is, it may have occurred to some people that adolescent boys will grow through a female size range of shoes. And so that's why I've got this kind of um, collaborative <laughs> um, category here. But interestingly, I am currently working with a physical anthropologist at the University of Durham, a, a, a Dr. Trudy Buck, who's fantastic. And she's actually applying some really interesting um, bioarchaeological methodologies to the shoes to see if we can actually nuance a little bit better about who's wearing these shoes. So um, stay tuned and we'll, I'll be able to talk more about that in a few years. 
So these are some of the shoes that are coming out of these spaces. The one on the right is from the Scola, a little bit nicer, higher end shoe, whereas these two right here are from the Barrack Block. Um, this one looks kind of nice. It's really just a bog standard um, child's shoe, a child's um, carbatina, one of those little just kind of booties almost, and a very small shoe there. This is my hand in case you're wondering. It doesn't have as much clout on Zoom, does it? Um, and this one right here, a little bit nicer with a little bit more decoration coming from the Scola. So it's just really interesting to look at this period four. Now, period four, if we're talking about 120, we are sort of, you know, in, getting near sort of 40 years sort of on the on the frontier, 35 years on the frontier of, of inhabitation up there. And so I want to pull you just quickly all the way back also to the very first period at the site. And this is something that I, I had actually already brought out in my dissertation, was that the footwear from the period one fort ditch, which dates to very early, 85 to 90 CE, very short period of occupation, already shows that we have these um, non-combatants, these non-soldiers in residence. 38% of the shoes belong to non-adult males in this earliest phase of settlement. And I think that once I get all of the recent data into my database as well, I will um, find that that's going to go up. Um, we have a couple of ways we can interpret this. It's a very short period, and we know that from this, this profile that you're seeing right here is from Robin Burley's excavations back in the 1980s, where period one, the fort ditches were filled over very, very quickly and not left open for um, sort of random discard. Um, and then the, the period two fort goes over it very quickly. Um, so we have a couple of options. Either the easiest one is just that these individuals are with the military and they are with them traveling and they are there kind of all the time. And the reason why that's important is because, you know, people have tried to come up with all these different ways of explaining this material. And so they want to think that, okay, well, women and children would have only joined the military once everything was settled. Well, we don't really have a, a really settled frontier up here for a couple of decades, really. Um, and if they're there with them in the very first period, when really we can see this almost as a period of conquest, then we really have to think about non-combatants in the communities always, right, at, at all times. So let's try to think about those people then. And this is about halfway through my talk and I actually don't know, there we go, 6.02, okay. If you also, those who know me out there know I can talk forever. So I'm gonna to try to keep this to uh, a normal hour and we can all go have dinner. Um, but I wanna talk about the social context of this evidence. So we wanna be able to bring the archeology span together with other categories of evidence so that we can you know, draw out as much as possible. And the texts don't really help us and I don't really wanna talk about the texts anyway, um, because as much as you know, they seem they were, drew, drew, people drew upon them for quite some time. Um, and it's easy to find really anything you wanna read in text, in the ancient text, um, whether you think that they shouldn't, women shouldn't have been there or they should have been there or they were there or they weren't there. You can find all your answers in there in any direction. Um, so I just love this kind of cheesy little drawing. Uh, it's from a site called Kelimantia. This is uh, the city of Itza in Slovakia on the Danube because it just kind of rightly shows, you know, without any um, shame, oh, hey, look, there's women and children just kind of hanging out in this, this community um, and supposedly, you know, showing us a, a fort and showing us, you know, people moving around a space like that. So let's just think about how is it that I try to approach then social, um, social roles and, and, and how people are actually living their daily lives, how important were they in military community. So one thing with shoes, other than I, I already stated, oh, I don't care about fashion, but actually there's a little bit to think about with style and status in Roman footwear. Um, the, the Romanists out there will know that shoes were actually pretty important to express status. Um, we read about the, you know, the senators were wearing these bright red boots and the equestrians were wearing black boots and blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't think that they are at all times wearing these sort of, you know, fancy state occasion items. But certainly in the Roman world, we have sartorial expectations that people would uphold based on class and status. We know that's true. It's true with rings. It's true with, you know, the color of your toga and what you had in your toga. And we know it with shoes. Et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at Vindalanda in this way, we look at the footwear, something like these two shoes that you're looking at right here, these are two different styles of military boots. You've got on the right, your very, very standard, totally bog standard 
um, soldiers marching boot with just your laces up here, very sensible for the Northern British weather where it's gonna be pretty cold and pretty awful. Whereas this doesn't actually make terribly much sense. But what this does is allows you to put perhaps, and this is just a hypothesis, perhaps a red sock underneath or any color sock underneath, it will show through the cutout patterns and you'll get sort of that flash of color that seems like it was something important at certain times in the Roman world. So these both come from the early, um, the excavations in 2019 from the early ditches associated with periods one through three. So they're in that, that early period. Um, and I have an argument out there from other spaces as well with these cutout shoes that they're very much showing, uh, uh, they're, they're very much showing status of the wearers. And what really struck me about these is if we look at the children's shoes in certain spaces, it suggests that they were also held to these sartorial standards within the fort. Now, I had mentioned that um, that very nice boot, we call this a, a sort of fishnet style. So this is just sort of a slightly less fancy take on, let's say this one right here, that one's quite fancy. But we have in adult male sizes, this shoe style that we call fishnet where it's cut out and you would have that opportunity to wear a color underneath that would kind of shine through, right? What's really interesting is that we only find these in the sort of fancier residences. So in what we call the Praetorium, that is the um, commanding officer's residence. So where the family, where the commanding officer, the, we call the prefect and his family would have lived. So we only find those in there. We don't find them, for instance, in the barrack blocks. So if we look to the barrack blocks, we've got all of these, you know, bog standard military marching boots in all different sizes. So also in kid sizes. Um, so here in the Praetorium, we get even this tiny little ch child's boot, it's infant's booty, really. This is 11 centimeters long. Um, I don't have my own kids. I hear that is probably not even a child who's walking, yet it is fully appointed. It has its little cutouts. It's a rather expensive shoe. It has a fully studded sole. Um, I suppose they could be walking. I walked pretty early in life, maybe other people did, but still, this is a very, very small individual. And this right here is probably an adolescent or even maybe sort of eight to 10 to 12, depending on the growth uh, individual, also wearing this sort of fancy fishnet style. So one of the arguments that I've been sort of touting lately and, and published in a recent article is that, the, that there may have been, or I, I argue from this, that there was a public role for the families of officers because why else would you have this kind of sartorial expectation? Why would you need to uphold such a thing if the officer's family wasn't in some way had some sort of public role. Um, and, and I point out this shoe as well. This is arguably the favorite shoe from Vindolanda. It's perhaps our best shoe. It's our only, well, one of two actually that has a maker's mark. And you can see that right there of this guy called Lucius Ibutius Thales, very fancy shoe. But we do have others that have this sort of cut out shape. That's very much a sort of feminine um, sandal style. So that also comes from the Praetorium. So all of these come from the Praetorium, these very sort of high-end, nice, fancy shoes. So my point here is that if they didn't have a public role, what would be the point of having these? And so this kind of notion that, all right, well, we can have them in the, we can have just the family of the prefect living in this really central section of the, of the fort. I mean, that's another thing I should point out is that the Praetorium is in what we call the central sector of a fort. It's in the three most important buildings right in the middle of the fort. You can't sort of hide if you're living there. So that kind of suggests that you have some sort of um, public function as well. Okay, so where else can we look for understanding this sort of argument and who these people are? Um, the military diplomas are also very interesting. So for anyone who doesn't know what this is, we have over a thousand, well over a thousand, actually well over 1200, 1300 at this point, um, military diplomas that are these bronze, this looks like gold, but in fact, they're bronze. This is just very well preserved. Um, documents that essentially are discharge documents for uh, a lot of different kinds of soldiers. I'm interested in the auxiliary soldiers. These are the non-Roman combatants. They're the units who are not the legion. So we're not talking about all of those classic legionary pictures that you see with their plumed helmets and whatnot. We're talking about the auxiliary soldiers who were raised from 
the conquered provinces of the empire. So we've got a whole bunch going on already with, you know, when I said earlier, the Romans, and I said, well, they probably weren't Romans at all. This is what I'm talking about. Um, we have a whole bunch of um, interesting things we could look at here. Um, but since we're talking about the wives, let's try to understand who these wives are of not your prefect and your, your commanding officer and your elite, but let's try to figure out who the soldiers are marrying. Um, the regular sort of everyday foot soldiers. And the military diplomas take us a long way in that argument. So what you're looking at here is all of the text on a diploma. All of this stuff is the, um, the formulaic, um, all of the emperor stuff, and then all of the units who are getting this, this discharge and blah, 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 blah. And then all the fancy people here. And then you get all the way down here. And it turned out that before I worked on this, no one had actually really taken a close, close look at this area down here. Whereas to me, I don't much care at all about all that fancy stuff at the top. When you get down here, you get the personal information of the Roman soldier who is in fact leaving the military at this point. You get his rank, you get his name and you get his tribe. This guy is a Besson, which is an area sort of uh, Thracian tribe, modern sort of Bulgaria, that kind of area. Now I'm going to go to one that's actually more interesting for us because some of them name wives and children. That one that I showed you before does not. This one, however, does. So what you have here is the rank of the soldier, and then you have his name. He is his name is Kataus. He's the son that F stands for Phileas of Bardus, and he's a Helvetian. That's roughly um, Switzerland now. And we learn about his family. We learn about Sabina Etius Uxori Etius, his wife who is the daughter of Gamus. So we learn a lot about the families as well. Also a Helvetian. Their children, they have one son, which is always um, just down to F, and a daughter, which is always spelled out Philii or Phil. And the sons are always named first and the daughters are always named second. And you have Aeus F, Vindelicus, and Aeus Philii, Materiona. So one daughter, one daughter here and one son there. This gives us a huge amount of information about these people. First of all, what I found was that very, very often the soldier and the, and the wife were coming from the same exact tribe, whether that's a sort of tribal um, cohesion that was staying true within the military communities or whether they were actually getting wives from, you know, kind of meeting wives or go, calling home for wives or some sort of situation like that from their home tribal unit. We can't say, um, but it does seem as though far more than this sort of, we have this kind of pretty picture or this kind of cute picture of soldiers would marry local women. And that certainly seems to happen as well, but not nearly as often as we had thought. That was sort of the only story I had ever heard, you know, and then the soldiers would marry local women. And it seems as though there's actually a lot more going on here. And the military diplomas are telling us that. But for our purposes, for sort of what is the impact? How many people are we talking about here? from a sample size of almost 600 diplomas, and this is data from a couple of years ago now, um, that preserved the section of the document. So I should say that we have well more diplomas, but they don't preserve that section. So without that, they're no good to us because we don't know whether they would or would not have named. 43% of these of the whole corpus name family. So a wife, whether that is a wife or a wife and children or only children, and 57% name only the soldier. But from 96 to 140 CE, so still well before we have any kind of potential change with any sort of marriage ban, if we're thinking about that, up to the year 140, which is also sort of a false, we don't want to think that suddenly they didn't have families in 140, the emperor Antoninus Pius changed the rules and did not give citizenship to, to, to children, which is what, why they're named from this document, they're getting citizenship. Um, so just after 140, the data is not good to us anymore. But in that sort of almost, you know, 40, 50 years, we have 70% of the documents name family members. So thinking that in this period in the late first century CE into the first century or the second century CE is when we really need to kind of look for this, this um, push in um, marriage by soldiers, whether we're calling that de facto marriage or, or whatever it is. Um, and that stands in contrast to the decades from 70 to 90 in which almost none name family, but the sample size is significant. So I just wanted to point that out that we're not just tracking the growth of military diplomas here. There's, there's a, an actual statistically significant change. 
Um, and then I like to point out that this coincides nicely with the archaeological evidence from Vindolanda in the early second century. Now, I need to make clear, though, that we don't have, you know, these diplomas come from the entire empire, and none of them come from Vindolanda, in fact. We have, I think, one or two little fragments in Vindolanda. Um, so it just kind of coincides nicely in terms of thinking around, you know, where we're going with all of the, these thoughts about when we need to start thinking about um, these individuals. So not in the third century after a supposed marriage ban shift or when the military was settled in the later second century, but really I think we have this happening straight through the empire, um, you know, beginning to end. Now, one of the newer things that I've been dealing with is this right here, the children. So somebody, some keen, I think, viewers out there will probably be thinking, hey, but those children's names are really interesting as well. And uh, they are. So how did the auxiliary soldiers think about the next generation? What were they, you know, how were they, were they retaining some sort of, um, you know, traditional or native identity or were they moving them into a Roman identity? Let's look at that. So out of all the diplomas, 93 have enough information about the children's names to evaluate. 50 of them have all Latinized and Romanized names, but which is a lot, but 43 of them have some sort of traditional or non-Roman names included in the family. And this is something I'm working on right now to, to write up, um, hopefully a COVID project, but who knows. Um, and the way that 43 of the traditional or non-Roman names, the way that adds up, or really the way it breaks down, I should say, is that 22 of them are all traditional or non-Roman, meaning boys, girls, everyone. Um, seven of them are have boys' names that are Roman and Latinized, Roman or Latinized, and girls' names that are traditional non-Roman. That's a really interesting category. And that compares or sort of this in stark contrast to zero that have girls' names that are Roman and Latinized and boys' names remaining traditional non-Roman. So that's interesting. Um, and then there is there are further 14 that have mixed Roman and non-Roman names with genders. So really kind of interesting. Now, let me just zoom in on a couple of those. I don't want to bore you with text for too long. But when we really look at that, you can see something like this, where the boy is Flavus and the girls are uh, Nene and Benzi. It's hard to even really parse that into Latin. These are definitely non-Roman names. This is a diploma from um, 99 CE. It's a Thracian soldier and a Thracian wife. So what's really interesting is if we can also evaluate the, um, the relationship and the names and even the father sometimes of the soldier and the soldier's wife, that could also give us a whole, that's giving us a whole relationship. So I don't wanna give it all away what I'm working on, but there's a whole kind of family relationship that we're seeing there. Um, and the, you know, a really interesting way of looking at this as well is when you've got the, 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 ch the girls, something like this one here, these names, Vagatra and Surya and Sata, those are also totally non-Roman. They, you know, Sata, I suppose, could sound almost Latinized in a way, but, but they're totally non-Roman. And you've got these Batavian parents up here. Um, or notice them right there. But then you look at, you know, the father, Marcus Opius Peronus, or sorry, Marcus Opius Frontinus, the son of Peronus, which is really interesting. So here we have a very, a Batavian with a very Latinized, with a, you know, a Roman citizen name. And you've got these, um, the children, the girls being given these more sort of non-Roman, more traditional native names. And so one thing that, that I have been kicking around and um, we've also been looking at in sort of different spheres with sort of this notion of women as women and girls as the protectors of, 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 um, of tradition. And that's actually very true in our world as well. I could flash up pictures of, um, you know, African couples where the man is wearing a very Western suit and the woman is wearing traditional, a traditional dress of some sort. Um, and this is something you see quite often. This is um, work that something like Ursula Rota does a lot with, um, really fantastic and interesting stuff. So I've been sort of calling upon that as well to think about this notion of girls as the sort of protectors of tradition and does that work with the Roman model as well. And then if we go back to that previous one, you know, you, you're giving the boys the names that they need to go into Roman public life. You know, they're, you're giving them everything that they might possibly need to, to be in that Roman world. Perhaps that's what's going on here. And then one last example here where we've got everyone, you know, Marcus, uh, Saturninus, and Augusta. You've got these very, the whole family is, is moving in a very, um, Roman direction, even though they're Apomeno, Apomeneth. So that's a, a Syrian, a tribe in Syria. So they're from originally from Syria. 
So that's all really interesting. Um, we can also look to, so that's what the diplomas are telling us. We can also look to um, the, the Vindolanda writing tablet. So if we jump back to Vindolanda, we have a community in the Vindolanda writing tablets that's also very um, prominent once you start looking. And now I start with this slide, with this letter, because everyone knows this letter, the birthday invitation. You know, anyone who's kind of done any, you know, uh, Roman women or any of that kind of stuff. And here, here it is. It's this great letter, Claudia Severa to her Lepidina greetings on the third day before the Ides of September. Uh, sister, for the celebration of my birthday, I give you a warm invitation to make sure that you come to us, blah, blah, blah. It's a great letter. Everybody loves it. Everyone cites it all the time. It does give us a good sense of things, but there are other letters. You know, if you just flip the page in the Bowman volume, which I've cited just down here for y'all, if you just flip the page, there's another one that talks about the permissions given to, in fact, Claudia Severa to go visit Lepidina somewhere on the frontier anytime she wants. And what's happening here are the two wives between the, you know, of these, uh, these auxiliary fort commanders are writing letters and they're speaking to each other and they're visiting each other and they're allowed to visit each other and they're allowed to move around. And it's really, really interesting to think about, you know, their, whether we have these sequestered lives or not. And I, I can't remotely argue that, that we do. Also, if we look further, we've got really cool letters like this. So once you really start looking for the community that pops out, rather than looking at these sort of standard uh, Roman military studies, things like who are the commanders and who are the governors and, you know, what's the unit structure and what kind of goods are they bringing into the fort, which is also interesting. Um, if you start looking at this community, letters like this, Clodius Super to Serialis greetings, most willingly brother, just as you had wanted, I would have been present for your Lepidina's birthday. So that's really cool to me. Like there's some sort of obligation that this soldier, male soldier, um, we're not sure of the rank, um, but that he would have been present for some reason at Lepidina's birthday. And I always think of like when you're supposed to go to the boss's wife's birthday party, the boss's wife's birthday party, and you're like, oh, my God. oh, because she, he says, I would have been present, but apparently he didn't go. So, but the fact that the wife of the prefect is somebody kind of important in this community, important enough that you should kind of maybe show some fealty to this, this family is, is really interesting to me. Um, so that's pretty cool as well. And then things like this um, got me thinking about women's networks in the military communities. And this is something that's also published. Um, a letter like this, Velata, who we think is probably either a slave or a servant of some type, Velata to her Serialis greetings. I ask my Lord by your posterity and through, which we're not really sure what that means, but and through Lepidina, per Lepidina, it says, that you grant me what I asked for. And that got me thinking as well. Again, this is kind of fragmentary. All of the Vindalana tablets, or most of them, are, are tantalizingly fragmentary. Um, but this got me thinking about this sort of women's network. She's asking through Lepidina, sort of as though Lepidina is your sort of ranking woman on the site as the wife of the commanding officer. And everybody else is sort of asking or, or, you know, through this individual. So I thought that was really quite interesting as well. So, you know, that brings us back to this image, the, the sort of legionary tribune with his wife, Lucinia Flavilla, priestess. Now it's completely normal, a legionary tribune, um, you know, in this particular context as well. Uh, this might even be from a civilian context. It's from, um, it's, well, it's now in Nimes in, in the archeological museum there. So this was a, a civilian city um, in Southern Gaul. So there, there are all these reasons why you might expect this. And a tribune, a legionary tribune is maybe only gonna be in the military for a few years. But I still like to show it because it gives us that sense of the wife of this individual, this military of actually having a prominent public position. And if we look around, so I started to ask myself, like, where else can we look for this kind of prominent position by women of any rank? And this is certainly, we're talking about elite ranks here at this point. Um, you know, we really do need to think, by the way, about intersectionality in, in women in the Roman military. And that's another thing that I'm hoping to get out soon is that you can't just say women and the Roman army, right? This doesn't actually make any sense. You really need to think about status and class and who these individuals are. Um, and never mind, we can't even really get at, let's say, the slave women who are in this um, environment, um, except for through little things like that, Velata. But if we start looking around, so where else can we try to find some evidence for these kinds of individuals in the military community? If you zoom right in on the center of Rome and you look at something like Trajan's column, um, there is evidence there for, and I'll just go right to that side, there is evidence there 
that you have women who are with the Roman military. Now, the arguments aside about whether you take Trajan's column as a historical document or not, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have in these images women who are sort of in a way crowbarred into the image. This one right here, like we're only looking at her back. They are part of all of these sacrificial scenes on Trajan's column with, with Trajan, they're making a sacrifice and there's a woman or a girl in almost all of them. Now, there's an interesting argument to be made, maybe that like this one is a boy, maybe this one is a boy, but uh, you've got a woman here, you've definitely got a woman here, you've got a woman here. And this is something that I'm also working on that is almost done. In fact, Nick, you'll appreciate, I'm writing this with Elizabeth Wolfram Phil, who is in fact a Michigan grad. Um, so Liz and I are working on this because I actually needed the person to do all that background stuff on uh, Trajan's column that I don't have any interest in doing. Um, and so we've, the, between us, um, and also actually Meryl Gensheimer, there's, there's three of us working on this, are coming up with some really interesting ideas about how to read this. But nonetheless, for a talk like this, I just want to point out that even on Trajan's column, in the middle of Dacia, war-torn Dacia, you've got women of, of a pretty high status, it looks like, with these individuals here, um, and potentially girls who are part of the religious existence that is so important to militaries on campaign particularly. Um, so we don't have to look terribly far to see, you know, other instances and, and evidence for these individuals. So I'm going to leave it there. I've probably been talking for, gosh, under an hour though. That's shocking for me. Um, there's my information if anybody wants to find me. Um, I can either stop sharing or if anybody wanted to see a slide again, I actually I'll stop sharing. And then if somebody wants to see another slide, I can easily go back in to share. Thank you so much, Beth, for a fabulous talk. It was really great. Um, we have a lot of questions here for you. And I am going to um, pull up the Q&A and just kind of go through uh, these and um, give them to you as you're uh, going on. So, um, OK, um, so uh, here's what well, first question is for me um, about how to access this recording afterwards. And um, I will tell you that we will try and uh, make this available through the Kelsey Museum lectures if if that works out, um, that you can send me an email, dlstone at umich.edu, and I will let you know when that's available, but it um, won't be uh, instantly in any way, but maybe you know within a, a few days. Um, OK, so next question is uh, for you. Um, were residential bread ovens found in the excavations at Vindolanda? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um... When you say residential, meaning like in sort of domestic spaces, perhaps, um, we find bread ovens all the time in all sorts of different spaces. In the military world, we often find them also on the um, ramparts. So the big kind of the ramparts would run around the walls on the inside. And it seems that they were maybe cooking in, um, in groups in the ramparts. Um, you know, you could cook more than just bread. A bread oven is, I think, around 400 degrees. Is that about right? Something like that. So, um, yeah, we find ovens all the time. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, is the database of leather finds and shoes publicly available? Um, it is not publicly available right now because it's not even available to me just yet. Um, it is about to go in live in terms of me and my team being able to work with it. And then we do hope that it will fairly quickly be able to, at the very least, if you email Vindalanda or you email me and you say, I'm a researcher and I'm doing this work and I want to have a look at, um, at the, the data, then it will be available in that sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, but hope, we hope to eventually go public with all of this stuff, but we're, we're in the process of getting thousands and thousands of artifacts uh, into a real modern database. Okay, our next question. Would each Roman soldier have been expected to make his own shoes, at least the basic version, or was it already a specialized profession? Um, no, probably not. It does seem as though they probably potentially did like some minor fixes on their own shoes. We do have a space in Vindolanda that I know I've said this about a hundred times this talk, but yeah, I'm writing it up um, that I'm looking right now at, but uh, I am on research leave as of um, yesterday. So that's a great thing. Um, 
but we we have a space that I would call a cobbler's uh, area that that was identified that way in the excavation. And I need to kind of go through and look at all of the tools and everything that's found there as a kind of reassessment and hopefully write that up. But it does seem as though this was a professionalized thing, particularly for the military. Um, and I have to imagine that things are also being imported in. Um, and, you know, things like the Lucius Ibutius Thales shoe um, that maybe was worn by Lepidina herself, perhaps, um, found in the Praetorium. That's something that is being imported. And we have another couple, that whole kind of genre of women's, very nice high-end women's shoes seems to be imported. Um, but we do have evidence that, that some people are doing their own little fixes. Um, they're adding studs to different parts of the shoe and things like that. And that's actually another aspect of my research right now with the shoe collection is to really look at um, some of these uh, podiatric and I'm working with some kinesiologists as well to try to understand health outcomes of, of you know, what would, how you would be affected by wearing these shoes. So that's going to be really interesting. As soon as COVID is over, we can actually get, you know, go somewhere and get anything done. Um, but, but there, I do have a little paper out on the podiatric kind of knowledge that they might've had from the shoes. So if you're interested in that, just give me a shout and I'll send it to you. It's in a obscure little volume called, I don't know, shoes, slippers and something or other and sandals from antiquity. It was a Newcastle conference. Okay. So there's a few more questions on shoes coming oh. at you. Um, how, uh, were shoes determined to be women slash adolescent versus woman. Mm -hmm. uh, why would a shoe be placed in one category instead of the other? Usually the ones that we can absolutely say are, are you know, were worn by a woman um, or are based on fashion as well, fashion and style as well, that they seem to very much be a female fashion. Um, and the other ones would be the, just the size range. So the basic equation is that Anything below 19 centimeters is also, this is post conservation. So we always, there's, there's some shrinkage potentially in conservation, but there's also an argument that shoes get waterlogged and get bloated. So anyway, but anyway, post conservation, anything below 19 centimeters is a shoe that belonged to a child of some sort, who knows where on the range. Um, 19 to 21 centimeters is a shoe that we call female, but it also, you know, a, a, a male, an adolescent boy could would grow through that size. So you often just get the, the category together. And then anything above 21 centimeters would be a male. And if you're talking about pre-conservation, you're talking more like 24 centimeters. But I mentioned very quickly, I'm working with Dr. Trudy Buck, who is a physical anthropologist, bioarchaeologist, and we're hoping to refine that a lot more um, with widths and various kind of, you know, methodologies from bioarchaeology. So basically using the shoe as a proxy for the bodies that we don't have at Vindolanda or really anywhere in Hadrian's Wall. So um, on the same lines, uh, were there left and right shoes? Yes, that absolutely. I get that question a lot. And I have a lot of people say, I heard that Romans did not have left and right shoes. Completely wrong, like totally wrong. In fact, you know what, let me show you a picture and you'll see that. I don't know, you probably weren't paying attention, you know, to that sort of thing while I was talking, but um, ooh, it never likes to, there we go. Let's go find a shoe. Oh, you know why I actually was showing you, okay, this is a good way to demonstrate it. Can you see that? Like how clearly that's a left shoe? Like the toes are even cut out on the outside there. Um, I didn't show you too many just simple soles today. Oh, there you go. This is totally a right shoe. There are some toes, but even with one that doesn't really have the toes, you can see, look at me turning my head just so I can see. That's clearly a right foot shoe. Um, so yeah, most of them really, there's not very many that you can't tell anything at all. Um, okay, so uh, another question on shoes. Um, is it possible that shoes were part of a business that helped pay for local goods? Um, so is, in other words, I think the question is, are there um, locals who are manufacturing these shoes for the uh, soldiers in the fort? Um, probably not. No, there probably is. Um, surely there's somebody, you know, who's making shoes. We also have Iron Age shoes, not we at Vindolanda, but there are Iron Age shoes known, um, not nearly as many as Roman or medieval. Um, so I don't want to discount it altogether, but probably they're making shoes within the fort, particularly for the soldiers, Roman military boots and things like that. And then I, I, like I said, I think you have to see a bunch of them coming in, um, imported in whether, and when I say imported, I don't necessarily mean they're coming from the continent always, but 
you know, they're coming from elsewhere and, and traders would be selling them in the, in the ports, I would imagine. Okay. Uh, whether we've got somebody out in a local, you know, village somewhere, uh, we just can't, we just can't know if we've got that happening. Yeah, and um, staying with the shoe questions, to what extent can shoes or other small finds at the fort help us penetrate through to lower social strata and enslaved persons? Or um, are we limited to diplomas and tablets for that? Yeah, well, we do have the spaces. So I'm, I was very interested in, um, we're very lucky at Vindalanda to have those first four periods for five really, but you know, 85 to 120 where we have the domestic spaces. And it does seem as though in many cases we have the actual um, sort of habitational remains, not just leveling fill building up. Um, and that's really important because we can start to think about, okay, and actually that's the paper that I'm working on with Andrew Burley right now is how does the material culture change from the cavalry barrack to the infantry barrack to the scola and then the extramural settlement, the extramural buildings that are just outside of the fort. And those are incredibly interesting. The extramurals, um, I think I even actually have some homemade shoes, some homemade kind of carbatini like shoes where they would just wrap around your foot. Um, and that would certainly suggest that you have a much um, kind of lower status, you know, whether I could say family or group or whoever living out there. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting paper that hopefully I think we're going to submit to Britannia, um, probably sometime over the summer, something like that. Um, okay, so there's a, uh, uh, some other questions that aren't shoe related, but I would say um, uh, we uh, really want to have you in Michigan and we want you to see the shoe collection from the Kelsey Museum from Karanis as well, if you haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, no, I have to see that. Like, yeah, yeah. I was so excited last year when I heard, oh, I got Ann Arbor for, you know, for many reasons. But I was like, oh, I'm a total cheap date in Ann Arbor because, you know, I drive there, I have family there, I have family live right outside of Detroit, you know, the whole thing. So I would love to come and I'll look at those shoes and it'd be great to, that's that's one of the, the good comparative, because that's another thing with Vindalanda, it's hard to find comparative assemblages because nobody else has, you know, 5,000 shoes. But um, right now somebody is bringing all the shoes together in London um a, a postdoc hopefully he'll, he'll get all the funding he wants and we're going to start collaborating as well so that'll be interesting yeah imelda marcos and us and um you guys okay so um uh, so here's a, a question that's not related to shoes um does a document always use uxor for an individual woman or does the term conjunx also also appear um uh is um Given the ban against marriage, uh, the term uxor being used improperly, um, or could many of those references to uxor apply to auxiliary force families where the marriage ban did not apply? Yeah, so, um, well, the auxiliary, the marriage ban did apply to the auxiliaries. So auxiliaries, legionaries, um, everyone was basically banned from marriage, except for at a certain officer class, they were legally allowed to marry. There's debate about what that officer class is, whether it includes centurions and decurions. Most people are on the side of yes, it included centurions and decurions. But just to be clear, the auxiliaries also had this marriage ban. Um, so wait, through that, I forgot the question. <laughs> okay, I'll get it. Um, so uh, the term, it's a, really about, um, uh, whether the term uh, um, books or- oh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay, books or conyanks, yeah, yeah. So that's a really great question and, the, and it is used interchangeably, in fact. Um, the two places I can point you towards, um, there is a paper by Margaret Roxon from 1991 in the 1989 Frontiers Congress volume that is like hard to get and all this kind of stuff. So if you're out there and you're, you know, somebody who really wants this for your research, give me a shout and I'll send you a PDF. I don't know if that's legal, um, <laughs> but I'll do it. Um, so that's, that's interesting because she goes through actually a lot of inscriptions and is looking for how often Uxor and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is, um, so I have a volume that's gonna be submitted very, very soon um, to Cambridge, hopefully accepted by Cambridge. They were very into the, the subject an edited volume that is on women in the Roman army. One of the papers deals with the soldiers and their wives and families in Rome itself. And in that paper we do, it's actually co-authored me and Alexandra Bush. And that in that paper, we do an interesting um, layout of, of 
the different terms of konjunks and uksor and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'd be happy to kind of have a look at that. If you want to email me, you know, for some of you that need this for your research and stuff, just give me a shout and I'll help out with that. Okay, um, next. But there are other words as well. Oh, and sorry, there's one more thing. Um, there's an article by Sarah Fang from 2004 called Intimate Conquests. Can't remember where it's published, um, but again, give me a shout. And um, it, it it talks about all the libertas. So there are a lot of women who are the who are the soldiers' um, wives who are actually supposedly their slaves at one point, and they were freed. So and so then you get libertas rather than uxor or konyungs. Okay, or you get both libertas et konyungs or something like that. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of questions coming up on uh, tribal affiliations. Um, so uh, first one is regarding soldiers and wives deriving from the same tribe, was there a policy to station families and provinces far from their place of origin? Um, and uh, uh, while legions would often be identified with a provincial location for long periods of time, were the soldiers and their families usually from other parts of the empire and why? Right. Okay. So this is sort of a like three part answer. So one thing is that the question about, uh, and I'm going to forget the other two as soon as I start talking. So I might need a little reminder. Um, one thing is that the, um, the, 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 that notion of the names of the units, like um, the Batavian, the first cohort of Batavians or the four, ninth cohort of Batavians, that kind of thing. Um, those started as these sort of ethnic units. And the Batavians are this interesting case as well, who maybe stayed more. So these are what we call the ethnic units. The reality of it is that they did not remain that way. And there's an argument about whether, you know, it was almost immediately in the first century um, or into the second century, at what point these um, shifted and kind of weren't exclusively a group of Syrians or Batavians or Tungrians or whatever. Um, but it looks like it's probably even by, you know, the end of the first century, sort of last quarter of the first century that this changes. And then we really need to imagine particularly, and I'm talking about the auxiliary units here, not the legionaries right now, because I actually don't really talk much about the legions. Um, the auxiliary units are, um, we have to imagine these groups of people from all over the empire, these very multicultural units. Um, there's a guy called Alex Meyer who works on looking at these sort of ethnic groups that stay sort of together in these smaller groups and like make in, within military units and make um, make dedications together as groups and things like that. So they so you do you have to imagine this kind of conglomerate of people that is kind of bound by the unit, but they have these smaller units, these, these smaller groups within. And one of the Vindalana writing tablets that I focus in on some, from time to time, I didn't show it today, but it, it says actually greet my, greet these individual people, some of them are women and all of my fellow countrymen. Um, and that's really interesting that, you know, you've got within these units, these groups, and that seems to kind of be indicative of that same idea. Um, so that's, that's that part of the question. What was the first part of the question? Um, so, uh, uh, was there a policy to station? Oh, right. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. Totally depends on the time and place, where you are, who you are. Um, for instance, Pannonians tended to serve in Pannonia, whether that's because I don't know, they were trusted. I don't really know. Um, and I'm sure somebody else has the answer to this. I just don't have it on the top of my head. Um, but other groups were very far. So on Hadrian's wall, we tend to have quite a few, um, Quite a few Germanic tribes. So I, when I was talking about Batavians, they are from the area around Amsterdam. Uh, the Tungrians we have there at Vindolanda, they're from uh, roughly Belgium, that kind of area. Um, the let's see, but then we also have um, just down the road. Uh, we have at, at Carvoren, uh, a fort called Magna. We have a group of Syrians who were there at one point. Down at Bert Oswald, which is another fort on the wall, we have uh, Dacians. So Hadrian's Wall has a lot of Germanic tribes. Um, so they're not going terribly far, but they have kind of, you know, moved them, removed them from that, that Germanic region and into another area. Um, but then other, and, and we have Syrians. So we know we've got people that are all over the place, um, coming from all over the place. But like I said, Pannonians tended to serve sort of in Pannonia close by. Um, so it really depended on who you are, where you are, and what time we're talking about. Okay, you are uh, doing
fabulous. Um, so here's another question on the same uh, uh, idea of names and so on. Um, you can hear in the chat, sorry, I just pointed out that there were some Pannonians in Egypt and then I, it went away and didn't finish. But yeah, definitely Pannonians could be shipped out as well. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Um, so uh, does your analysis of women's names suggest that they are, um, quote, taking on, unquote, the tribal affiliations of their husbands at all? Yeah, it's something I'm still looking into, kind of like creating these, if you will, kind of family trees as best as I can. It's, it's We don't have that much information. Um, but it, no, it doesn't seem as though it's not like they're yeah it's not like they're taking on it, it doesn't seem as though they're saying okay i'm not helvetian but i'm going to write that now that i'm part of this family because they also name their own father which does suggest that they're kind of keeping that identity in some way that original identity um but ultimately if that was happening um you know hopefully i'll keep finding information and and it'll become clear onomastics is a tricky tricky old thing Okay, um, next question. Uh, uh, what does Vindolanda mean? Oh, uh, most people think it means uh, like white fields or, um, you know, white land, white, that, that, that was a bad, you know, and, and they think that perhaps um, when people first approached the site, maybe it was either wintry, it was snowy, it does snow up there. Um, or it, it has this big hill over top of it. I didn't show you in this. I don't know if any of you guys were in my archaeology of bridge talk the other day, you saw some fantastic, you know, sort of vistas of Vindolanda. Um, but there is this big hill, it's actually a quarry that looms over Vindolanda. And actually, we don't, the frost stays until sort of 9, 10 in the morning once the shadow goes away from the big hill. Um, so maybe they came in the morning. But yeah, it's something like white, white field. Okay. Um, why would a soldier be given a diploma? Oh, it's for discharge. So when they are discharged, and actually that is a common question. I mean, that's that's a common debate, scholarly debate. Did everybody get a diploma? Did everybody need a diploma? So one of the arguments is that they would need it actually, in fact, to prove um, citizenship of, so the soldier, what it's giving them is the soldier gets citizenship after, so an auxiliary, this is why I'm interested in the auxilia. The auxiliary soldiers are non-citizen soldiers. So the legions, and this is true, you know, first century into the second century, this all gets kind of muddled later. But the legions um, were, sold, were, were citizens and the auxilia were non-citizens. So after their, their 25 years of service, um, they, and that's once it's standardized, there are some early rules that change, but they get citizenship, they get the right of connubium. Connubium means they have the right to marry a non-citizen woman and bring up their children as if by two Roman citizens. So effectively, that gives the children citizenship as well. So the diploma gives the children citizenship. The person who doesn't get citizenship is the wife. She's left out of the, the picture, which is <laughs> typical, but you know, but they don't really, she doesn't really need need it because with connubium, you're then able to enfranchise your children basically. Um, so people argue that you would get the diploma, that you would need to carry around the diploma if you really, if you needed to prove your citizenship. Um, and this is very, um, sometimes people compare it to like, um, okay, I'm not really very religious, but what's the whole story? Is it Peter who is, um, he says, hey, you can't do that. I'm a citizen. And everyone just kind of believes him. And so there's this notion that there's this habitus, there's this way you would look. And, um, and that would prove you're a citizen. Well, if you're an auxiliary soldier who's, you know, originally from, you know, Germania inferior and you don't really look the part, you're going to need something to prove your citizenship, perhaps. So that's that's one of the arguments. There's also there are other arguments that actually not everybody got it, that you only got diplomas for through special grants, but that's been kind of like knocked down several times now. Um, so, yeah. You're going to want this thing if you need to prove citizenship and, and connubium and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's a question, and um, you may have answered uh, a related question earlier um, that I think was about how to tell the difference between um, women's shoes and adolescent shoes. And then mm -hmm. this question is about how do you tell um, uh, uh, men's shoes from women's styles, or were any larger sized men's shoes found with? women's styles, in other words, were there 
women with big big feet, perhaps. Yeah, okay. yeah, we do find a couple of those like very typical women style shoes, a sandal that I showed you, sort of something like this. Like, oh, sorry, I'm not sharing the one with the shoe with the cutout, the toe cutouts. Um, we will find those kind of up to maybe 23 centimeters, 23 and a half centimeters, but certainly not 26, 27 centimeters, which are the very large, the very large issues we have go up to like 30 centimeters. Um, so yeah, we will find those sort of lower, which, which indicate you've got a sort of a, a woman with a larger foot. Um, but, um, yeah, generally, you know, generally when the way we tell that something is a woman's style is usually we'll either be pulling it from, um, just kind of generally the way the shoe operates, but also from Roman art, right? We'll be able to see what was a kind of standard thing for different kinds of people. Okay, and um, again on the shoes, uh, have you been able to correlate shoe sizes through skeletal analysis of feet? So yeah, so that's what I was talking about my wonderful collaborator, Trudy Buck, and that's the kind of stuff that we're, we're doing right now, sort of looking at it's a little bit difficult because a lot of fashion will change the shoe size and the shape of the shoe and how the shoe is supposed to fit. In fact, so I can point to something like a winkle picker, which is like a very, very pointed shoe that goes here. So your overall length of a shoe in that fashion sense isn't always going to correspond to the size of the foot. So you do have to keep in mind things like um, wear impressions and patterns and things like that. Okay, and a um, couple more uh, and questions on shoes, and um, there are two here that are related. Is there greater evidence of damage to children's shoes than women's shoes um, because of the kinds of activities that children would typically engage in that might lead to more scuffing and tearing? Of you know, it's interesting. Um, I wouldn't actually classify that as a sort of child or adult thing. I would classify that as a status, class and status issue, because if you're out there working, you know, your, your average wife of a soldier isn't leisurely hanging out at home eating bonbons, but she's probably out there working and probably out there supplementing the family income and all that. Um, so I, I, in terms of children's shoes, we, we do, we find all range of shoes. Um, that are worn out. And so a lot of people ask, you know, why are the shoes thrown away? Um, certainly we have evidence that, you know, you've got a hole worn right through the heel or the toe or something, and then it just goes into the bin. Um, so that makes perfect sense. That's not always the case, um, but often we're finding just a sole unit. So actually I'm on this particular slide. So I might as well just show you this, what you're looking at right here is a sole unit, both of these without the uppers attached. And so Sometimes it's harder to tell, perhaps the upper completely wore off or it came detached. And these things were at least cheap enough that for some people they could just throw them away. We do have evidence that some people are fixing their shoes as well. And so we have, um, for instance, a carbatina that is, I don't have it in this PowerPoint, um, but we have a carbatina that is, um, has a patch on it, has a big patch or at least the sewn marks where they would have put a patch. So they were trying to get longevity out of that, that shoe. Now, I'll also say that for children, the carbatina style was preferred. There are a lot of, we find them in adults as well. Don't, don't get me wrong there. Um, but the carbatina style is ubiquitous with children. And that's perhaps because that's just a shoe that would kind of wrap around the foot. And then you just kind of, um, you know, put a lace over the top. And you could really loosen that as the child grows. So if you were trying to, you know, save a little bit of cash and not buy a new pair of shoes, you could continually loosen that to a certain extent. So if you want to hear more about shoes, um, definitely dip into Archaeology Abridged next week. So if you go to the AIA website, just Google Archaeology Abridged. And next Thursday at 1 p.m., I'm going to be talking only about the finds that come out of the, I gave one last week that sort of introduced you to Vindolanda and next week is about the finds and it'll be a lot about shoes. So you can see all sorts of cool pictures of shoes and people fixing their shoes and cutting their shoes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, there's one last question about shoes. Um, 
were there slaves there and at Vindolanda and did they wear different quality shoes? And you may not be able to answer. Yeah, we can't really answer that. There were definitely slaves at Vindolanda for sure. Um, the, the Roman world, they, this is a slave owning society. And so we kind of have to imagine them in all sorts of um, places. There is an article coming out, not by me, um, by uh, Adrian um, High from, who just finished a PhD at Duke, all on the slaves in the Roman military. And he has an article coming out in Tyche, I believe very soon. Uh, classics journal um, about slaves in the Roman military um, and or slaves associated with the Roman military. So there's a lot of interesting evidence. Um, at Vindolanda with the shoes, we really can't tell because there's a whole range of shoes. There's, there's basically like fancy shoes and then all the other shoes. And we can't really tell if that was just sort of a, a soldier, a foot soldier, his family, um, a slave, you know, everybody, maybe slaves, some slaves maybe weren't shot at all. Um, probably be better to have your slaves wearing shoes. They could probably get more work done, but so the answer really is we can't tell. Okay, um, so uh, here's a question about the uh, women, children, and officers and soldiers. Um, do you think that the public role that women and children played relates to the status and rank of the soldier, um, our officers' aristocracy? Um, okay, so yeah, definitely your whole experience as a woman associated with the Roman military is going to be completely dependent upon your status. And that's what I meant by we really need to look at this intersectionality that like you can't just say what was the experience of women in the military just like you can't say that for anything today. Um, so it would totally depend on um, the husband, the soldier who you were associated with. Um, and I would, I, I think that, um, the way we can see that, like the lives are gonna be very different. So we, we see with the, with the, now, of course we don't have the writing tablets for, you know, saying this is what I did today. Whereas we do for the elite to a certain extent, right? The, the elite wives of the, of the, um, prefect are skipping around the frontier, visiting each other, saying, you know, greeting each other's children, having birthday parties. I seriously doubt that that's what the wives of the foot soldiers are doing. Um, I do have a, a goofy little paper in one of the Frontiers Congress uh, volumes 2012 or something, maybe published in 2015, something like that, um, on just sort of hypothesizing what they would have done. And I would argue that they're probably supplementing the income in many different ways. And for that, I've also kind of looked at um, armies, modern armies from like the 16th to the 18th, 19th centuries. Um, and, you know, you have women who are washer women and um, you have midwives in this situation because, of course, you're going to have births happening. Um, so there, there are all sorts of things. Um, we also know from a place like Vindenissa, which is a legionary fort in Germany um, or Switzerland, um, that, uh, you know, would have been in a Germania. I can't remember which one. Um, but anyway, they, uh, there's evidence that there was a woman who was an innkeeper, that sort of thing. So, um, so you do have all sorts of class, uh, you know, status of women. And, and I think your experience would be 100% affected depending on where you stood on that hierarchy. Yeah, um, great, thank you. Uh, so um, here's another question about the things that you found. Uh, um, is there evidence of medical areas? at the fort or instruments? Yeah, so there are these things called wall, a, a wallitudinarium, wallitudinaria, plural, that um, are hospitals. They're military hospitals. They're kind of hard to detect in the archeology. span So there's one at a fort down the road called Housesteads, which is another one of the famous Hadrian's wall forts right on the wall. Um, at Vindolanda, we have a space that we're pretty sure is in fact a wallitudinarium in the early period as well. So it, period four, I believe. Um, that maybe because it has a number of small rooms, um, but you know, at the same time, we're kind of like, maybe it's not, it's hard to say. Uh, it's very clean of artifacts, um, whether that's just our notion that a hospital will be clean, you know? Um, so it, they, they're hard to identify. Oh, also there's a legionary fortress um, way up in Scotland at a place called Inchtuthel that was constructed in the sixties for about, um, four or five years, something like that, and then never completed. And there's a big military hospital there. So, um, so that's, that's, those are a couple of places to look for that, that data, but they are hard to identify and difficult to prove really. Um, here is a good final question for you, Beth. Uh, do you have an online slash social media presence? Aside uh, 
page <laughs> on your universe? Uh, you know, I guess the real answer is no. I am on Instagram, but it is entirely my dog. So, you know, if I if I am abroad, which I'm not right now, if I'm abroad, I'll show you some cool ancient sites. Um, but no, usually it's my dog in very sleeping positions and running through the snow. Um, so if you want to see my Britney Spaniel, she's absolutely adorable and I love her. And her name's Agrippina, so the elder, of course. Uh, but otherwise, not really. I am right now, a couple of my student team members, project team members are making a website. And so that will be actually live pretty soon. So it's going to be for that. The project is called the Vindalanda Archaeological Leather Project, VELP for short. Um, so if you write that down and you periodically Google it, and it's, it's a Wix site. Um, so that will hopefully be coming online in the next, I don't know, month or something, month, month and a half. It's sort of like, you know, students have exams and then they get lost in what they're doing and then they forget to pay attention to you anymore. But so yes, hopefully soon is the real answer. It, it, yeah. Okay. Um, this is really fabulous. And uh, thank you so much. It was an outstanding talk and um, we really uh, will, you know, get you to Ann Arbor um, so that we can do this in person, but um, stunning uh, 159 people I saw as the, was the max, um, that I saw at any one time, maybe somebody saw more than that, um, but that is uh, so thanks. much more. Thanks and, to the 80 people who, uh, you know, stuck it out until 7 p.m. too. That's amazing. Yeah, so anyway, really, really happy um, that you could take the time to do this and share. Cool your research with us um, and your ideas about uh, people on the Roman frontier. So it was really excellent. So people are asking um, where to find this and um, you can email me, uh, davidstone, dlstone at umich.edu um, and I will let you know when it's available, but um, it will uh, you know, be there. And um, of course I'll let uh, Beth know too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and use it for teaching, you know, whatever. It's, it's, this is the best thing about, you know, Zoom talks. We, we can actually use them for good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, you, you know, um, uh, 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 I can hear a lot of clapping thanking you for. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fantastic. I love speaking to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you want to hear more from Beth, um, tune in uh, to her Archaeology Bridge talk next week um, or look for her, um, get, you know, giving more of these Zoom talks in the future. Cool. So, All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.